get underway. So welcome everybody and let's just uh, remind you that it's actually through the generosity of these partners that we're able um, to run this conference and it's a conference that, that uh, really helps people to connect all around the world and talk about things that really matter in education so we're very grateful of course to all our sponsors um, and although we're quite a small cohort in the room right now thankfully this session is going to be recorded I can see we have another participant who's just arrived hi I've got Jay Cairns in the box maybe you could type into the text chat and tell us where you're from where you're joining us from now the whiteboard is open so um, if you if you're familiar with this tool oh from Tulsa great um, oh, I'm going to have a song going around in my head now for the whole session <laughs> um, if you come to the whiteboard tools just to the right hand side there's a little bar next to the participants the second tool down there um, opens a, a series of little um, images and you can choose any one of those click on it and then pop it onto your location so there I am obscuring most of the UK <laughs> and there's Serbia <laughs> we can see Serbia brilliant thank you so we got a quick snapshot of, of what we're doing here connecting people across the ocean which is brilliant right so we will move on to my presentation very shortly we're just going to check that the first slide is ready here we go so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the experiences that I've been having over recent years um, and these have grown out of the work that I have been doing for the past 10 years in my teaching capacity in higher education connecting uh, students with their peers in other countries doing something called virtual exchange and virtual exchange has been known under various names over the years you may have come across virtual exchange um, in the guise of uh, telecollaboration or telecollaborative projects you may have heard perhaps of um, virtual exchange being referred to as online intercultural exchange um, you may have seen various um, acronyms for this sort of activity um, but essentially virtual exchange is making use of the online tools that we have now to help um, educators and their students connect and discover each other um, and really what we've been doing in Europe in particular just recently um, with the support of the European Union is to uh, look at how we can understand virtual exchange and what it does and how it develops skills um, but also make sure that um, we can widen those opportunities so that's what I'm going to tell you about today so a journey as I say that has been going on from my perspective for over 10 years um, is, is now receiving some much needed support thanks to the European Commission and uh, that's what I'll explain it's great to see that we've had many people more, many more people joining us in the room so welcome to you all welcome Dania and Patrick and Martha do feel free to use the text chat throughout and just pop into the uh, text chat uh, tell us a little bit about where you're, where you're coming from where you're joining us from and Patrick I can see is just testing his audio as well and checking in uh, um, whilst I'm working through these slides do feel free if you have a question or a query just to pop it in the text chat um, so that I can help with that so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, have a little look here at um, some of the uh, resources that I have available for you so let's just uh, share this slide with you hi Martha in Nevada that's great to have you here um, you can see here you've got either a short uh, URL link or you've got a QR code that you can scan with a mobile phone um, that's going to give you all the additional resources that you might wish to use 
Um, and for those of you who maybe know already quite a little bit about virtual exchange, uh, you've got something here to take away. And Daniel from India, wonderful. Great, that's marvellous to have you here. I hope you're hearing us all okay. Do feel free to use the text chat um, so that we can uh, get to know you a little bit. So the QR code or the short link there that you've got will take you to a Google document that gives you some more details about this session and also gives you some follow-up resources uh, to some of the issues that I'm going to be talking to you about uh, that we've been exploring around virtual exchange with um, the support of the European Union. So let's, without further ado, put to bed what is virtual exchange. Um, and you will see various definitions because um, various people are involved in something they would perhaps broadly refer to as virtual exchange. Um, so the purpose of the projects that I'm involved in, hi Joe, welcome, um, is to start obviously from a point where we have a shared understanding of what virtual exchange is. So we're talking about computer-mediated learning, so the sort of thing that we're doing right here, right now, multimodal learning where we're connecting, in this case, synchronously, but often asynchronously too, connecting students from geographically remote areas um, so that they can work together online. Um, so the sort of tasks they do are particularly important, and usually they're developed by teachers or educational facilitators. Um, and on the document that I shared, uh, with you in the slide just now, and I'll, I'll share a link in the chat um, as well for those people who may not have seen that uh, document. Let's just grab that link for you and pop it in the chat. There we go. Um, you can see there there are some further there's some further resources there to explore that a little bit more. Right, so. We're going to have a little look at um, some of the aspects of virtual exchange um, and why virtual exchange. Why do we as educators feel it's important that actually we should um, be developing virtual exchange? Well, here's a, here's a very important reason. Um, when we think about exchange, or mobility in any context, whether it's um, perhaps trips abroad or uh, spending a year abroad as part of a study course, sadly we know that actually that affects only a very small minority of our overall student population. So what about the rest? How do we make sure that we offer those sorts of opportunities to students who, for whatever reason, cannot um, take advantage, perhaps, of um, access to mobility, access to physical mobility as part of their learning. We know that physical mobility and living in another country to study is very valuable, but clearly not everybody can undertake that sort of opportunity, maybe because their course doesn't offer it, or perhaps just because of financial restraints or barriers um, either of cost or of responsibilities or maybe of disabilities. So how do we make sure that these students um, actually still have the opportunities to have those very rich learning experiences that come with living in another country or connecting with people who have a different worldview perhaps, who are from different cultures. And this is therefore one of the sort of key targets for us of uh, virtual exchange to actually help increase um, access to such opportunities. And uh, you can see that the European Union have recognised that this is uh, an issue that needs greater attention. So the two European supported um, activities that I've been involved in over the last uh, couple of years um, have provided two routes to actually tackle this issue. Um, one of those is through a project. So this is the uh, this is the sort of quite typical um, arrangement that you may go through getting funding uh, in higher education in order to embark on a project with several partners. And the other was actually via um, a tender that was put out by the European Commission. 
Um, so they've both taken slightly different routes, but they have total synergies in terms of what they're trying to achieve. They're trying to facilitate greater um, virtual um, exchange between individuals within um, their education in either higher education, even in youth and informal education as well, um, and also to get a better understanding and a deeper understanding of what is gained through virtual exchange. So the first of these, and you'll see that each of these has its, uh, in the next slide sets, you're going to see that they, they both have a slightly different theme to their slides. Um, but each of these, as I say, is, is looking at the same objective. And in fact, there, are, there is overlap in terms of the people who are involved in, in both of these. So the Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange Initiative is supported by the European Commission. Um, it was uh, a tender that was put out by the Commission that's uh, constantly reviewed and uh, has some very, uh, some very uh, demanding targets in terms of the visibility and the, and the uh, objectives that we try to reach. Uh, and it's actually staffed by uh, several, and the tender was um, successful due to a collaboration of several uh, different organisations. Uh, and you'll see a little more of those in just a moment. So the Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange is the one I will speak about first. Uh, and then I'll talk to you a little bit more about the Evolve project, which is a research project into um, the experiences of virtual exchange. So first of all, Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange and their definition of virtual exchange and what they aim to achieve. And you can see here that the target is very much um, uh, the MENA region. So that's the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and connecting Europe with young people, particularly from the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and what it aims to do here is to provide a, a, a range of activities to support um, those young people in getting to know each other. So we'll see a little bit more of those activities in a moment. Uh, it, is a, it is groundbreaking uh, because it does mean that all the, all the uh, young people that are involved in here in this activity, um, they just all they need to be able to do is to access the internet um, in order to access these activities. Um, here are their objectives, and they're quite uh, deep personal objectives, and they're very much to do with developing skills. So we're wanting to encourage uh, intercultural dialogue and to increase tolerance through people-to-people -people interactions. And these typically take place in very small groups, um, often just five or six people, um, and uh, connect them and help uh, to open discussion. Um, as I say, there are various types of virtual exchange, and that's where we're going to go next. We're going to look at the different types of activities uh, that are facilitated. And clearly, because all of these things take place online, it does require um, a learning curve in terms of digital literacy as well, so people get to experience the sort of tools that we use. We know that typically people tend to return to the same tools they've always used. And one of the things we try to do is to encourage people to try different tools and to perhaps think about their tool use in, in slightly more critical ways as well. Um, so. The activities that we do, uh, there is a, a range of these activities, and um, I will show you some of those and talk to you in more depth about the ones particularly that uh, I'm involved in. Um, so here's one of these, and this, these are interactive open online courses. Now, if you have the um, uh, Global Ed Conference Google Doc in front of you as well that you've shared, then you can see uh, the details of the consortium here working under Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange to deliver these. So IUCs are typically run by uh, Celia, or Celia uh, and also Sharing Perspectives Foundation. Um, that's one of the types of activities. So using bite-sized video lectures and uh, 
encouraging um, interaction around those um, using online tools. Advocacy training, which is very much again about um, skills development, in this case listening, uh, developing listening skills, developing debate skills, um, and using uh, skilled debate facilitators. This typically is uh, the Anna Lind Foundation that provides this, but all under our banner of Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange. Uh, we have uh, a further activity here, which is online facilitated dialogue. Again, trained facilitators, usually with small groups of young people. So these are under 30s. Um, quite challenging. I've, I've really enjoyed participating in these sessions. This is something that, this is something that I have experienced as a participant, um, although I'm out of the 30, 30 or below age bracket, but somehow they let me in. So I have to say these are these are very rich ways of having quite deep conversations with a small group of people, thanks to the skills of the facilitators who help to make you feel comfortable and to build trust so that you um, don't feel exposed in this situation. Um, and this has been very popular, and uh, all of these activities actually have been uh, taken up in good numbers. So the final one I'm going to show to you here is the one that I know the most about, and because um, I'm part of an organization called Uni Collaboration, and I'll pop that into the chat. Uh, and you'll find us at unicollaboration.org. Um, uni Collaboration is an interdisciplinary um, academic organization. We've only been uh, in, uh, in being as such for the last a uh, couple of years, but we actually came about through um, a separate project, a European project around um, telecollaboration for uh, higher education, and it was specifically geared to language teaching. So that's how I first came across uni collaboration. But since then, that's developed into something that is um, has a wider reach and really has a kind of social justice agenda. Um, so this is about encouraging practitioners in universities to think about how they could uh, design a set of tasks with their students and deliver them through um, collaboration with a peer in another institution in another country. Um, so what we deliver through Uni Collaboration is the training to develop what we call these um, transnational Erasmus Plus virtual exchange projects or TEPs for short. Uh, and TEPs really are very much about adding uh, another intercultural dimension to people's um, experience of university. Um, and ha having been part of the training uh, for TEPs, uh, I've been very privileged to be part of that. And seeing just how people do, um, practitioners, given the experience of virtual exchange. First, we very much go down an experiential route. Um, are really very creative about how and who they would partner with in order to develop a TEP. Um, and although uh, our, our focus is very much on connecting European universities to MENA universities, so that's people in the Middle East and North Africa, so we particularly look to pair um, uh, institutional practitioners with people in Algeria, Tunisia, and other uh, Middle East and North African countries, um, we also see uh, people connecting um, around the world. So it's been great to have um, connections there on all sorts of um, all sorts of different aspects. So we've had everything uh, from connecting uh, rocket scientists in uh, um, Finland and uh, Germany, and we've had people connecting for a language element, uh, perhaps with practitioners in business. But actually, it's, it's to the, the sort of projects people come up with are very wide and very varied. Um, and all that we really ask is that those projects should be sustained. Um, so usually, they last at least four weeks. Not four weeks constantly. There may be a few hours a week, a week during those four weeks. Um, but 
they need to be sustained long enough for people really to feel the benefit of um, virtual exchange. So those are the sorts of activities that Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange offers. And as I say, the, in terms of numbers, they are quite high. We have um, uh, thousands of people undertaking these sorts of activities around the world, as you'll see if you follow the document there. Um, and you'll notice that if, you, if you're on social media there, on, the, on that document there are links to our social media um, accounts. You'll also be able to follow um, some of the activities we do um, there around um, uh, advertising the courses and things using that hashtag virtual exchange or using the hashtag Erasmus virtual. You'll very quickly track those down and see what sorts of things we do. So I'm going to pause just briefly before I move on to the um, to the second strand that I'm going to talk about. So Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange, as I say, was supported by um, the European Union uh, through a tender and is a consortium of uh, different organizations offering uh, a range of uh, different activities, different forms of virtual exchange. Um, and what I'm going to move on to now, and just want to welcome Karen and Michelle, who I see have joined us. Great to see you. And Karen, I think you're on your mobile device, which is brilliant. Do you feel free? Hi. Feel free to pop into the chat there where you're joining us from. We know so far that actually in the room we have folks from the US and from India and from Serbia in Europe. So great to have. Um, lots of people joining. Oh, Karen from South Africa, wonderful, great. The more of the world we can connect uh, in here today, the better. Right, so virtual exchange, well that's what we're doing in Chicago, great. So here's the second strand. So the second strand um, of virtual exchange that I'm involved in is a project. So this was a European Union project um, that uh, we bid for. And there were several higher education institutions involved in the bid. And thankfully, we were um, successful. And the aim here was to, is to mainstream virtual exchange. But certainly, we have um, collaborated, therefore, alongside the work that's going on with the Erasmus Plus virtual exchange. And we're looking for uh, collaboration across disciplines in higher education. And what we were able to offer, thanks to the European Union's support, was free training online for practitioners who were interested in experiencing virtual exchange. Um, bear in mind, many uh, stakeholders in virtual exchange, international officers in higher education, for example, had never experienced this at all. It was, it was just, it didn't mean anything to them. So it was actually very crucial that we encourage them just to take part in a virtual exchange with other practitioners and see what can be achieved with the sort of technologies that we have these days and the sort of facilities either for synchronous or for usually a mixture of synchronous and asynchronous activity. So that's what we've been doing with Evolve. Um, as you can see there, the uh, acronym stands for Evidence Validated Online Learning Through Virtual Exchange. So this was a step up from an earlier um, European project where we looked at telecollaboration uh, in order to really focus our attention on researching the benefits of virtual exchange and looking at uh, the skills that are developed both uh, from staff and from students who are interested in, in everybody's um, experience here of virtual exchange. Uh, but also we were looking to build capacity. So we're looking to help support um, individuals in their uh, skills around virtual exchange. Because as those of you who have presented in this sort of uh, environment know, you do need a, a pretty good range of digital skills in order to do this successfully. And if you want it to work as well for um, students who perhaps haven't experienced this before as well, it helps to understand what you're doing. <laughs> but very often, we do this collaboratively with students as well. So you can see here on this slide the partnership of Evolve. 
And you can see two very important groups there. It's possible that some of you um, are aware of the Coimbra group or the S group, which is Santander's group of universities. Um, you can see the University of Leon in Groningen, so Spain and Holland. Uh, the Sharing Perspectives Foundation, who are also involved with us in the Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange, the first strand that I looked at. Colleagues from the Open University uh, in the UK. Uh, Grenoble, so in France. Padua in Italy. The University of Warwick, which is the institution that I work in in the UK. And Malmo University in Sweden. And you can see also the search, search for common ground. Just, just uh, reminding my husband that actually <laughs> I need him not to talk at the moment. <laughs> so we're now um, we now looked at um, really the uh, the two ways that we've looked at br uh, approaching this issue of broadening out the experience of virtual exchange, but also better understanding what is gained. Is virtual exchange as good as physical mobility and spending time abroad? And clearly that's something that we are researching on an ongoing basis. And you'll see because there's ongoing dissemination um, throughout um, this project, um, you'll see those results coming out in the form of reports. Um, so that's why I've shared with you there the um, social media strands so that you can also uh, follow those links and see, uh, connect with us as those reports come out. Uh, because clearly we're looking at benefits and it's very important uh, for us that we establish uh, what the benefits are um, for the students that take part. Uh, and particularly there we're looking at skills, skills development. Um, so virtual exchange is very, task design is crucial when we talk about arranging and organizing virtual exchange. So we do spend a lot of time in the training thinking about the things that affect your task design decisions. Um, including your choice of technical tools, but more importantly perhaps the inclusive nature of your pedagogy so that we can really make um, good use of the time that we have uh, through the tasks to develop um, student skills. And uh, you can see there that the skills that we work on particularly include things like intercultural communicative competence, being able to communicate effectively with others, where, whatever their background and whatever their situation. And this draws heavily, obviously, on the literature in the area because within higher education we do have um, plenty of literature, plenty of experience of these sorts of interactions. Uh, we also look at digital literacies. Uh, and, and in particular, there, rather than thinking about frameworks for development of digital literacies, we increasingly work on critical digital literacies. And I shall speak a little more about those in a moment. Um, and we also look at, look at how we can be effective when we have to collaborate and work together. So typically when we look at the sorts of tasks that we design, we start with ways of connecting and understanding and uh, building empathy with the people that you're um, working with. But our overall aims in a task may be to collaboratively design and produce an artifact or um, to communicate something. And, and that do, does require a depth of trust. Um, so these sort of skills development, this, this, these sort of skills that we try to develop are obviously significant when it comes to working effectively in teams. Increasingly in real world situations, people have to work with teams who may be physically not close to them. Um, so this is very much uh, an opportunity to help develop those skills. Um, very important for the f future of many of these young people. I think it's very important as well on a social, in a social perspective. And when we look at the TEP design as well, we look at encouraging people to go beyond what we call the three Fs, the food, fashion and folklore, which tend to be the topics for tasks that are intercultural tasks, which kind of connect at a rather superficial level. 
Um, but these, in fact, uh, what we try to do here is to, to go to a deeper level and see if perhaps students of art and design can help um, develop the communication skills of students maybe involved in, um, in an ICT project. So by connecting people in different contexts, so non, uh, so that the groups of individuals are heterogeneous, they're not the same. Um, those are the sort of areas where we actually see the greatest gains. So that's really important to do. I see we've been joined from uh, from Pakistan as well, from Amul Am Amanula. Amanula, I hope I got your name right. Thank you. Thank you so much and welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, so we do look to encourage our trainees, our, um, our practitioners in HEIs to think about how they can make really effective tasks designed perhaps to address things such as the sustainable development goals. How are we going to give a really good quality of education, uh, which is SDG 4? How can we look at social justice? How can we improve our institutions? All of these sorts of um, ideas can help generate really creative and really useful interactions. Um, and that sort of thing is, is very important to us. So skills development clearly is important. But as part of this, clearly there is also a need to develop the teachers who can uh, facilitate these sorts of developments. Um, so looking at how you can move your teaching methods forward, how you can improve your online teaching skills, develop co-teaching skills, um, how you can refresh your engagement with pedagogy and how that is affected by working in either synchronous or asynchronous modes. And I notice in the chat here, Martha, thank you, you, you gave us um, uh, a question there. Can virtual exchanges take place with teams who aren't online at the same time? Yes. Time zones are one of the biggest challenges of virtual exchange, but yes, they can. We use in, uh, in virtual exchange, we use a range of asynchronous tools as well. Um, so that can be anything from the basic uh, sort of sharing uh, a virtual learning environment space um, and using forums. At one level, most um, practitioners would have access to a virtual learning environment or to using um, social media and using tools and I'll share with you some of the tools that we tend to use. So things such as Padlet, for example, which you may be aware of. Uh, I'll pop some of these into the chat. Um, uh, Jamboard, you may be aware of, it's a Google tool. Um, we tend to use Google Suites as well. Google Suites and Google Suites for Education have got uh, really useful tools there, so a Google Classroom. So yes, a, a mixture of synchronous and asynchronous tools um, apply here. Um, so um, as we're talking tools, this is perhaps the best time here to mention critical digital literacy. Um, because one of the things that obviously became apparent, we're now in the second year of the Evolve um, uh, evidence-based uh, research into virtual exchange, uh, was that tools clearly did lead to, or tool choice was one of the most um, demanding and difficult tasks um, for many of our higher education practitioners, making those choices. Um, and, and maybe having found a tool they were really excited about, then finding that the students were much less excited about it, uh, and finding that these things were, uh, were not as straightforward as they thought. So our training, and we have a, a co-laboratory approach to our training uh, with Evolve, um, allows uh, tutors to reflect critically on their choices. So we focus in there on critical digital literacy, and I've put quite a lot of resources into that Google document. And again, some people have joined us um, just recently, so I'm just going to add that link in once more into the chat so you can see that. Um, so there's a little Google document here with all the additional resources. This is just the ability to reflect and take a step back and see what sort of effects um, choices of tools can have. 
Um, I've seen in the in the chats just going through that several of you have mentioned that Padlet is a really you know people like that tool. It's a great tool, and and it is a very effective uh, and very nice tool. Um, but it's not terribly accessible if you have a, a, a visual disability. So knowing that may affect your choices, and particularly obviously if you've got people with visible uh, with uh, visibility issues within your groups, because once you start to use a tool that effectively marginalises some of your students, you're already going to affect the possible outcomes of your virtual exchange. Having designed something that is pedagogically sound and a task that you really are keen is going to work, and then using a tool or making a tool choice that maybe makes uh, participation difficult for some individuals. So clearly those are issues that we as higher education professionals and as teachers take very seriously. We don't want people to be left out. So the critical is important, uh, it is critical even, it's very, very important to think critically about our tool choices. So what's happened through our um, training, through the uni collaboration training, is that we've been able to um, help practitioners connect, share the tools that they use at the moment and talk about them, but also share information that they have about those tools and how they potentially uh, can marginalise or affect the operation of power within the context of your tasks and your task design. Um, so that's, those are important conversations. And the reality, as all of us know, um, in, a, in a very rapidly changing um, environment in terms of um, technology use and very different contexts around the world is that none of us are on top of all the time all the things that are happening. That's just a fact of life um, and I'm sure we're, we all sort of have that realisation uh, on a regular basis. So if we can't all be on top of everything that we need in terms of understanding what we need to know, then we need a community of practice. And what has happened through the, both the virtual exchange initiatives that have been running, the um, Erasmus Plus virtual exchange and the Evolve exchange, is that we've had a, a, an opportunity to build communities of practice around those practitioners who are engaged in this sort of activity and to support each other. So we, we tend, therefore, to, um, to lean on and to find positions or places of trust uh, where we can actually raise these questions and find alternatives and find better ways to do things. Why do we need to be critical? Well, the, the reality is that we do need to ask better questions about the technologies that we choose. Where's the data going? Is the data reliable? Is the source reliable? Is it going to stay? If we make something online, and often our students perhaps create an artifact together, is it still going to be there next week? What's going to happen to it? Is it going to contribute to their professional development? So there are all sorts of good questions we need to be asking when we engage young people in these sorts of tasks. The, the reality is that technology has the potential just to replicate inequalities that already happen. So inequity is, is an area, uh, in fact, you may have come across the hashtag techquity uh, if you're a Twitter user. So we talk about you know, the equity of technology, techquity. Um, really, we have to be wiser, and that's uh, around developing our digital wisdom. But we can only develop wisdom through experience. And we incre increase or improve our experience by collaborating together. And the third thing that is a very important point to make, and that is that the pedagogy comes first. So when we're designing tasks for virtual exchange, we're thinking critically about the pedagogy. What does the pedagogy do to actually empower uh, equally all our participants? Um, and from there, we look with an equal critically uh, critical lens at the choices of technology as well to make sure that we're not just uh, reproducing the sort of inequities in terms of access to educational opportunities that we see already in the real world. 
So uh, there's a, a quote there that I finished off with from John Dewey, and this is very much a, a, a warning, I think, and it was, it was very prescient of him to come up with this uh, many years before we were sort of tied into the sort of digital um, silos that we are subsequently involved in, but it's very important that we're not just blind cogs and pinions. We need to understand um, the tools that we're using, the effects of the tools that we're using as well. It's not all about tools. It is very much about um, being open to connection. Um, but as I say, the, the challenges that we face by the very rapidly changing um, tools development around us mean that we do have to be aware and um, um, perhaps we have to work together more, uh, more openly in our very different um, contexts to better understand the challenges. Uh, I know there are, there are many parts of the world where, in fact, electricity may only be reliably uh, available at certain points of the day. So, you know, how can you organize a virtual exchange that is based on synchronous interaction and a good full access um, to the internet where we presuppose everybody has uh, full broadband access? Uh, and that simply isn't the case for everybody. So we have to be a bit more creative and we have to look at things through a more critical lens. So finally, <laughs> my last slide here, there's uh, that QR code back to the um, resources document, which I hope you have found. And um, feel free to pop any questions into the page if there's anything I can help you with. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining me today. Um, if you have any questions, no matter how uh, small or silly they may seem to you, I'm sure they won't be um, small or silly to me. So I very much look forward to um, taking your questions and queries and uh, to uh, knowing more about your context. Have you engaged already in virtual exchange? Is this something that perhaps you think your, um, your trainers or your teachers might be interested in uh, getting involved in? As I say, we do uh, we do run free training. It's all online. It's very much um, uh, uh, spaces for joining a community of practice for people who are actually interested in virtual exchange. And Joe, yes, thank you, and thank you very much for your kind comments. Joe, yes, virtual exchange for um, school age. Is, is a little bit more tricky, but does exist in Europe through something called the e-twinning program. Um, and you're, uh, let me just see if I can grab a URL for you there to look at e-twinning. It's been very successful in Europe, um, connecting all sorts of schools. Um, and there's a home page here that I will pop into the chat for you. Uh, and this is the European initi initiative, again, looking at supporting through Erasmus Plus um, school teachers in finding connections. So in the same way as um, the uni collaboration activities in higher education, we run partnering fairs online to help people find partners and to support them with resources. The eTwinning network uh, does the same thing for um, school age young people. Um, so yes, really worth taking a look uh, if if you're working with under 18s, uh, because clearly there are it, it is a little more complicated. You have safeguarding issues that you have to be aware of when you're working with uh, younger people. I spent myself 15 years working in uh, secondary education, so I I can uh, empathise with uh, the challenges that are involved there. But do please connect. Do connect to me. Um, as you'll find me online as at Warwick Language on Twitter. And uh, my blog and my uh, website are all linked on the uh, document there. If you scan that QR code, it's actually the same QR code to the document that you had um, earlier. Wow, Daniel, can you tell me what a PYP teacher is? <laughs> I'm very sorry not to know that, but there are so many acronyms and not enough time in life to learn them all. Do you tell me, what is a PYP teacher? I could guess, but I'll get it horribly wrong. Do feel free to um, turn your microphone on. You do have microphone permissions, so if you do want to speak aloud, please do. Ah, primary year program. Oh, lovely. 
I, I have to say one of the one of the most uh, rewarding challenges I ever had with um, online interaction was actually through um, uh, a grassroots um, primary school initiative that was called Global Classroom. Um, and Global Classroom used to run sessions for primary school teachers where they designed lovely tasks and they were often a mixture of real tasks um, and, uh, and sustainable development goals actually they used to focus on very much and uh, for example there they had a teddy bear that travelled the world and it went from classroom to classroom and each classroom every time it arrived in their classroom um, contributed to the teddy bear scrapbook and teddy bear and scrapbook travelled the world uh, connecting all these primary classrooms and the uh, global classroom blog at the time used to, um, used to share that and it was a really exciting initiative and yes, Daniel, it was really nice. And sadly, it, it no longer exists. The people who who ran it are now busy doing other things. Um, but I, I but I understand there are still versions of it um, because it really had such a, a a big impact on people's experiences. Um, that was a, that was a fascinating project to be part of. Great. Well, thank you all very much. Are there any other questions before I uh, finish off? Um, because I think I need to move on to a slide here from the Global Education Conference. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments here. That's great. So there's a reminder here for me to switch off the recording, which is what I will do now. Great, thanks for following me on Twitter, that's brilliant. 